First Peter 5, 12 through 14. Through Silvanus, our, bro- our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greetings. And so does my son, Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace be to you all who are in Christ. Let's pray. Father, after the great deliverance of your people out of slavery in Egypt, you bring them to the mountainside, covered in smoke and fire, call them to join before you, and you speak. First salvation, then instruction. And this moment here is no different than if we were standing at the mountainside, ready for your voice to boom down. Your word will come today, and by it, your presence and your authority, and every heart in the room will be affected. It will either be made more soft and tender to you, or it will be stiffened and made hard. And therefore, we're in great need. And we admit to you that we can't make our own hearts soft. We can't give ourselves ears to hear and eyes to see. We don't want to be hardened. We want to be made soft. We want to stand firm in the grace that you've given. And we admit that apart from you, we can do nothing. You say that you'll give grace to those who humble themselves. And so we admit freely that we need you this morning. And so now, Lord, we commit to act on the promise that if we think carefully over what you've said, you will give us understanding. So give Matt gifts afresh and powerfully here that he might preach and you would speak through him. And then give us ears to hear that would be eager to obey our God who is in this room reigning by his word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Can you hear me? Am I on up here? Sort of, kind of? Oh, there it is. Yeah. All right. Well, you can open your Bibles to that passage. That's 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, the last three verses of the book. If you need a Bible, there's a bunch of extras over there on that table. You're welcome to keep one. And uh, before I begin, a couple of just very brief announcements. The first is that I mentioned uh, last week that I anticipated having finalized making the recommendation for our pastoral council members and that the affirmation, which according to our bylaws happens on the part of the deacons, would all be complete by this morning. And indeed, that is the case. They have been affirmed, both Millard and Greg. So that's something to praise the Lord for. That's a long time uh, plowing and laboring and learning the will of God according to the scriptures and also just a lot of prayer and work by the people in this room. And so a lot of God's grace to be thankful for. We will uh, do something as far as a more formal installation tonight at our, it, it has three names, dinner on the grounds, family meeting, business meeting, call it whatever you want. It's going to be all those things. So uh, that will be uh, tonight. So if you're uh, planning on joining us, that's where we'll formally install those two brothers in that role. Second brief announcement is that, as I mentioned, today is the last sermon in this letter of First Peter. We're finishing the whole letter this morning, and you might be wondering, what comes after this? And the answer is the Gospel of Luke. That'll be next, and so you can begin to prepare your hearts, read that Gospel. It's the longest of the four Gospels. I'd encourage you before next Sunday to give it a read-through. You might break it up into days. You might read it all at once. It'll probably take you 
two and a half hours to just read it all the way through, just so you're aware. And then tonight, again, at our family meeting, I'll call it, uh, we will pass out sermon cards for what we anticipate will be the first uh, eight or so verses through the Gospel of Luke. Okay? All right, so let me begin as we dig into our text here. I just want you to think briefly about a phenomenon that probably a bunch of you have actually experienced yourselves. Maybe you've been running or working out, and you've had some support person, like a coach, for example, show up at the one-mile marker or be next to you there when you're working out and exercising, exercising, and maybe if you're running, the coach yells out to you, get going faster, they're on your trail, or you're behind pace, you've got to pick it up. And his yelling actually succeeds in motivating you, in pushing you to get you going faster. It works, in other words. We can be affected by things like that. But it's not just athletics. Most of you know that my previous background was in rehab or therapy in the hospital. And we'd have these patients who had all but given up. They'd really succumbed to the difficulties that they were experiencing until that old therapist came into the room and started pushing and prodding and encouraging. And I really do believe, no credit to the therapist, but just the way that God made human beings, having another person come and push you and get you going, got a lot of these people over the hump, and they were able to kind of get going, and they wouldn't have otherwise. Give you one more example. The final book of the Lord of the Rings, there's this scene where Aragorn, the king of the army of men, has led his troops, small in number, up to the Black Gate. That's basically the worst place you could ever take your army, because that's where the supreme villain is located, and there they stand, and the huge gate opens, and then Aragorn looks, and he sees all his soldiers, and they are physically, literally, taking steps backwards. They're terrified, right? It's almost certain death, right? They're outnumbered 100 to 1, probably. And so there's this great scene where Aragorn, the king, sitting astride this mighty chestnut war horse, thunders up and down the battle lines in front of his men, bellowing out a message of inspiration, instilling courage in the men. Here's just a little snippet of what that sounds like. I see in your eyes the same fear that would take the heart of me. A day may come when the courage of men fails, when we forsake our friends and break all bonds of fellowship, but it is not this day. This day we fight. By all that you hold dear on this good earth, I bid you stand, men of the West. And then if you've seen this scene in the movie, all those same men who had just been slinking away in fear start physically taking steps forward. They hold their chests high, their faces are bold, and they're ready to face the battle. So you see the same thing happen, whether it's athletics or rehab or epic battles Think about human nature for a minute. Human beings are apparently the type of creature that can be affected. You can be affected by this kind of encouragement and support. In a good way, we are vulnerable to encouragement and prodding. When another person comes alongside us and pushes us, encourages us, and tells us that we must go on, God has designed us in such a way that it works. Often, turns out to be exactly the kind of help that we need. And in our passage today, that's what Peter says he's been doing for five chapters. Exactly that. Urging them to stand firm in the faith. So let's pray and ask God that not only will we understand the passage, but we too, like the first Christians who received the letter, will stand firm in the faith. We can't do it unless he helps us. Let's ask for his help. Father, it's a sober subject to talk about standing firm for a number of reasons. One, that there have been so many Christians who have not, or so-called Christians who have not. They turned out not to have been Christians, and they uh, turned away. They quit following Jesus. Today they call it deconstructing, but it's the same old thing. It's been going on for forever. The root doesn't, the seed rather, doesn't take root. It doesn't produce fruit. That's a sober thought, Lord. And we're weak people. We look at the commands of the scripture, like the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. 
And we pridefully pat ourselves on the back until we remember the words of the Lord Jesus who said that the same root is in all of our hearts. Anger might produce itself or uh, express itself rather in murder or just internal anger, bitterness, resentment. We all would be guilty of that, Lord. We fall short. Thank you for John the Baptist's words for sinners like us who said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Father, we together praise you that sin is apparently something that can be taken away and that Jesus is that Lamb who did just that and took our sins away at the cross. Thank you that you've put us here in this community. We pray for, in this case, this morning, the judges of Tipton County. Lord, bless these souls, these people made in your image and help them to do their judging with justice. Thank you for other churches. Thank you for Lucy Baptist Church and their pastors David and Jonathan, both of whom I saw this week. These good brothers, thank you for the souls, the saints in that congregation. Would you bless them? Would you cause them to know, even this morning, the manifest presence of Christ among them? Bless them, we pray. For people far away, Lord, the Antankarana in Madagascar, these fishermen with a syncretism of Islam, and other religions. Lord, would you bless these souls? How can we be used? How would you use us? To pray, to support, to sin, to go. Lord, I pray that you would save those people by your own outstretched hand. Thank you for this church, Lord. Thank you for the souls in the room. Thank you for Bill and Janice Algy. Thank you for your grace in their life, the encouragement that they are to us, their love for your word, their love for your people. Would you bless them richly, conform them increasingly to the image of Christ and satisfy their souls down deep at the deepest part, all the deep, deep parts that we seem to not have any access to, but you made and you own and you rule, satisfy them with your presence. Give them joy that comes out in the way that they live and talk. Bless them, Lord. We pray for our own church, Lord. We pray that you would cause us to be a people marked by discipleship. Older women teaching younger men, younger women rather, men entrusting things to men who will teach others also. Lord, would you cause us to be a people marked by this kind of discipleship? Teaching one another to observe everything that Jesus commanded. Discipleship. Essential to the Great Commission, essential to our continued existence. Lord, make it so. Make us marked by it. Fathers, we consider this passage about our great need to stand firm. So great that if we don't stand firm, we have eternal ruin, eternal condemnation, the fires of hell. Lord, would you cause us as a people to stand firm with our eyes on Christ who died for us and rose for us and who is all our hope and who is coming back. Cause us to trust you with our lives, even the suffering and the persecution. Make us stand firm. Make us trust you. Make us cling to you. Make us trust you more than we trust ourselves and all of our ideas or feelings. Lord, be supreme in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple notes on context. The most obvious feature of the context is it's the very end of the letter. It's Peter's goodbye. Now, if you were writing a letter like this one to a persecuted group of Christians, I don't think you would end your letter carelessly, just willy-nilly, just however it turns out. You wouldn't, and neither does Peter. He ends his letter, as we'll see in just a second, in keeping with his overall purpose. So to help us wrap our minds around the context just a little further, I'm going to draw out two features of the passage. They're related. They're simple. The first feature, you might want to flip back to see this one to the first two or three verses of the whole letter. So that's chapter 1, maybe verses 1 and 2. And what you'll see 
is a lot of the same words and themes that are in the very end of the letter are also in the very beginning of the letter. In other words, he starts it and finishes it the same way. So, for example, if you look at verse 1 of chapter 1, Peter identifies himself as Peter, right? So there he is in verse 1, and then back in our passage in chapter 5, he says, I have written to you. So that's a simple one, Peter, at the beginning and the end. But there's so many of them, it's hard to ignore. A second one, again, chapter 1, verse 1, he calls the recipients of his letter chosen by God. They're chosen. And he says the same thing back in chapter 5 in our passage for this morning in verse 13, saying that they are chosen together with she who is in Babylon. So again, starts with chosen, ends with chosen. Flip back again or look back again to chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the letter. Peter refers to the recipients of his letter as being scattered or dispersed. So they're chosen even though they're scattered. They're chosen even though they're disperse. They're not at home. Now, you might look for those words, scattered or chosen, in chapter 5, our passage for this morning, and of course, they're not there. But he does allude to that, I think, by referring to she who is where? In Babylon. Now, what's Babylon about? It has to do with being dispersed. See if you can finish this phrase. When Old Testament Israel was conquered by Babylon, they were carried away into what would you say? Exile, yeah, that's what I would probably say. They're scattered. They're taken away from their home. They're put into exile. And not only that, they're also living among pagans who are in charge of the place. And they're under a lot of pressure to conform. More on that in just a minute. Let's keep looking at the similarities. There's only one more. Chapter 1, verse 2, Peter wishes for them to have peace from God, grace and peace. And then note the very last verse of the whole letter, verse 14 of chapter 5. He again wants them to have peace. No peace with Babylon, but peace with God. Now that's a lot all at once. You may have to go back later this afternoon and relook at those. For, this, for the moment, it's okay that you just notice that the beginning and the end are really similar. The same themes come out. What's the point? Why does that matter? Why is that important to notice? The answer is that Peter has in mind an overall theme that he's writing about, and it, of course, shows up, it would make sense, in the introduction and the goodbye. It shows up both places. Well, what's the theme? He's writing to persecuted Christians who are not at home. They're scattered. They're dispersed. And yet, Peter's message is, even though your circumstances scream at you all day long, that you are neglected, and abandoned, and God doesn't see you, I'm telling you that what you see in your circumstances is not real. It's not true. God has chosen you. You are chosen even though you live scattered. That's a part of his main point. That leads to the second big picture feature, which is related. It's similar to the first one, and it's basically this. Peter is reinforcing the main point of the whole letter. Not just the introduction matches the conclusion, but the whole letter matches the conclusion. All of chapters 1 through 5 are reinforced as he closes his letter. He wants to drive home his point so that he can make it stick, just like when preachers end a sermon, they often try to take the main point and give it to you in a way that you can hang on to because nobody can remember everything from a whole sermon. Peter's doing the same thing so that his words won't have evaporated into the atmosphere of forgetfulness. He wants his words to stick. He wants them to live on it so that they really will stand firm when they leave church and it gets hard and all their feelings and sufferings rush in. They'll remember what he said. He wants their faces emboldened. He wants them to stand up straight and face suffering, even when they go back to their slave quarters. Can you remember that you're chosen standing in your slave quarters? Peter wants them to, and he reinforces that point as he closes his letter. Now, what's the main point? Again, if I asked you to write down on a slip of paper the main point of the letter of 1 Peter, what would you put in there? What's it about? Say you had a friend who never read 1 Peter, and you told them, we just finished going through First Peter as a church. And they said, oh, First Peter, you know, I've never really read that. What's that about? 
What would you say? Here would be my attempt. Stand firm in the truth of what I've written in this letter. When your friends talk bad about you, this would be to the first century recipients, and they quit inviting you to spend time with them because you refuse to offer sacrifices to Artemis, the fertility goddess, and when they even blame their own infertility and miscarriage on your Christianity because you're not honoring the gods like you're supposed to, like we all are, even when all that comes upon you, stand firm in your fidelity to and your hope in Christ. Suffering like that is God's will for your life. Stand firm in that grace. That's what Peter's message in 1 Peter is all about. He's reinforcing his main theme. I'll just give one little aside about another theme that he brings up and reinforces in verse 14. That's chapter 5, our passage, verse 14. He tells them to greet one another with a kiss of love. Not just any kiss, a kiss of love. Now, by my count, Peter's already written five times in this letter with five chapters about their need to love one another. Again, a major theme reinforced. Some people get hung up on the kiss of love because we're squeamish about physical contact. The kiss, I don't think, is the main point. What was the kiss of love? It was a greeting meant to express warmth and love so that you could have a master and a slave, maybe from different households, meet together on Sunday morning and greet one another with a kiss of love that showed that they were equals and that they had love for one another. That's what it's about. Now, this is the end of our context. It's a lot of details. You don't have to remember them all. Here's what I want you to remember about our sermon text. Peter is reinforcing the main point of the letter. That's what it's all about. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to help them take what he's been saying for five chapters. Remember, they would have just heard this out loud one time, the original hearers. He's trying to take his message and give it to them in a nutshell in a way that they can use and apply. So now we have to look at the passage. We'll do that in two parts this morning. The first part will be the cast of characters, that's all the people in the passage, and the interchurch partnerships that are there. And then the second part will be how those relationships or partnerships enable us to stand firm in God's grace. First, the cast of characters and the interchurch partnerships. You're going to need to look at your Bible to follow me here for just a minute. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12. There's a lot of people in the passage. There's a lot of names in there. It's like a crowded stage at the end of a play. A lot of people there. So look at verse 12. Peter is on the stage. He says, I have written to you briefly. So, of course, there's Peter. Who else? Verse 12, if you look, begins with this reference to Sylvanus. There's another person, more on him in just a minute. Then there are the recipients of the letter. I have written to you. If you remember from the opening of the letter, this is a letter written to a whole bunch of different churches. Churches in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to chapter 1, verse 1. So they're all here. I have written to you, all y'all churches. Also, fourth, Peter mentions God himself in verse 12. This is the true grace of God. So here he is. Verse 13, number 5, there's a reference to this she who is in Babylon, which I'll argue in just a minute is Peter's way of actually referring to a local church, the one where he would have been at the time, but we'll come back to that. And then in verse 13 also, number 6, there's this person who Peter calls my son, Mark. Again, we'll come back to him. And then finally, the last word of the whole letter is Christ himself. Well, that's a lot of people in three little verses. Peter, Sylvanus, all five churches that got Peter's letter, God, the church in Babylon, Peter's son Mark, and Christ. Man. All these people are involved in the Christian-to-Christian, -Christian, or we might say church-to-church -church relationships that unfold in this letter. Each of them, all seven, 
has some part to play. Think about this. We'll come back to what they do, their part to play, but they're all here. And Peter is not just wasting space and filling up his letter for no reason. He's including all of these people on purpose. We'll come back to their roles, what they do. But I said I would come back to a few of them, three of them especially, because who they are is not immediately obvious. Okay, the first one is Silvanus. Do you know that name? Peter says he wrote in verse 12, through Silvanus, or Silvanus, however you pronounce it. Most people believe, I think rightly, that Silvanus is the same man called Silas in Acts, dealing with the difference between a Greek name and a Latinized name. He shows up in Acts multiple times. He's got an extensive resume, actually, in the New Testament. Shows up many times. Silas. Remember, he and Paul were in prison together there in Acts. But what is this writing through Sylvanus? I don't ever, if I'm going to send a letter, write through Caleb, for example. I would never talk like that. What does that mean? Well, probably it has to do with the fact that in the first century, letters had to be hand-delivered. There was no USPS or FedEx or UPS. They didn't exist. You had to hand-deliver them. So if you wanted to write a letter to five churches in faraway regions or provinces... Somebody had to take it there. They had to carry it on some journey. You needed what you would call a courier. That's Sylvanus. Second, she who is in Babylon. Now, I told you, I think that the she who is in Babylon means a church. But you should know that there are some who have argued that this was Peter's wife. We do know that Peter was married because Jesus went to his mother-in-law's house, and Paul also mentions, kind of in passing, that Peter had taken a wife. So he was a married man, but I don't think it's very likely that he's referring to her here. It would be an awfully strange way to refer to your wife, she who is in Babylon, and the people who received Peter's letter had probably never met her. It would be strange. Instead, with most commentators, I think it's more likely that she is a reference to a church, probably the church where Peter was currently stationed, the people who he was basically writing from, perhaps in Rome, perhaps not. Hard to say for sure. That leads to the issue of the Babylon part, she who is in Babylon. Now, if you read Revelation, the Apostle John talks about Babylon, and he means it as a code name for Rome. But that's not the only biblical connotation. We talked about it before. You finished my sentence. When Old Testament Israel was carried away by Babylon, they were carried away into exile. Babylon represents the place where God's people lived as exiles, where they're under intense pressure to conform to the pagan norms. What do I mean by that? You remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And that fire that Nebuchadnezzar heated up seven times to its normal heat? Where was that? In Babylon. That was Babylon. I think that idea, this scattered and pressured idea, fits with what Peter is talking about in the big picture of his letter. He called them scattered when he first greeted them in chapter 1. And what's he been doing in all these five chapters? Helping them to resist the pressure from the pagan nation under whose rule they're living. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had to do even in the fire. So I think when Peter says, she who is in Babylon greets you, I think what he means is something like this. Why does that matter? Something like this. The church where I'm at, the the church that is also living in exile, scattered, not at home yet, and pressured by the pagan rulers above her also, this church, she sends you greetings. She sees you. She greets you. You're not alone. Third and final character, the person Peter calls his son, Mark. Is it possible that Peter had a biological son and he named him Mark? Well, of course it is, but I think it's more probable that this is the same Mark, who's sometimes called John Mark in the book of Acts, to whom Peter refers in Philemon 24 and 2 Timothy 4.11. He shows up multiple times in Acts also. This would be the same Mark who wrote the gospel uh, of Mark. And who was, according to church history, closely affiliated with none other other than Peter. 
So probably not his biological son. Okay, so that's all the characters. I know it's a lot to take in. There's a reason all this matters. Sylvanus the courier, the church in metaphorical Babylonian exile, and Peter's spiritual son, Mark. Why does all that matter? I said we'd come back to their specific roles, what role they played in the relationships that are in the passage. What part did they play? So let me just begin by asking you a question. Answer it silently in your mind. When is the last time that you engaged in some form of written communication, like a text or an email or a letter, anything of the sort, a card maybe, with the specific goal of encouraging some other Christian or Christians to stand firm in the faith? Answer in your mind. Maybe leaving written communication aside for the moment, when is the last time you labored for the faith of another person by communicating somehow with them? Verbally, anything. Can you think of a name, a face? What if I make the question a little harder and I say, when's the last time you did that for some Christians that you've never met in person? What about for Christians who don't live in the same part of the world as you do, far away, overseas maybe? When is the last time you went out of your way to labor for their faith so that they could stand firm? You got your name written down in your... Imaginary slip of paper? I don't know what your answers would be, but have you considered what Peter is doing by writing this letter? He's living in a different part of the world, and he's apparently learned that these Christians who got his letter are being persecuted for their faith. And for Peter, it's not in one ear and out the other. He doesn't say, well, there's nothing meaningful that I can do. They're far away. They're not a part of my church. He doesn't say that. If he had said that, this letter would not exist. Let me ask another question. More broadly, on church-to-church -church relationships. Peter's a part of a church. He wrote to a bunch of churches. Here's the question. Should churches build relationships with and partner with other churches? Should we or should we not imitate Peter and Sylvanus in what they're doing by writing this letter? Or should we remain insular, focusing only on our own health and our own growth? I think it would be really hard to reconcile the fact that this letter exists and what Peter says in it with an insular attitude. We could illustrate it in Sylvanus's case also. I mentioned there was no mail, had to be hand-delivered. I think Sylvanus is the courier for the letter. What does that mean? It means that he left the comforts and ease of home and he journeyed to deliver this letter to a faraway land for some Christians that he'd never met before. Traveling would have been dangerous. There were no cars. Odds are Sylvanus made the journey on foot. That's a Herculean effort to encourage some other Christians, to build relationships with some other churches. My goodness. Listen, whether or not these Christians collapsed under the massive social economic pressure heavy on their backs was not a matter of indifference to men like Sylvanus and Peter. What happened to other churches was not a matter of indifference for them. And even she who was in Babylon and Peter's son Mark get in on the action. This interchurch partnership sending their greetings to all those churches there in verse 13. That's their role. They send greetings. What are the greetings about? Why are you saying, Matt, that greetings are a form of interchurch partnership and relationship? What are the greetings about? What's their purpose? 
The answer has to be that the greetings serve to encourage the other church to say something like this. You matter to us. We see you. You're not alone. You're valuable. You're chosen like we are. God's had mercy on you. He'll keep all his promises to you. You're one of us, the people of God. Church to church greetings. We greet you as God's people. We're not talking about ourselves as individuals right now. We're talking about ourselves as a church for a moment. Church to church partnership. So again, silently, see if you can answer this question in your mind. With which churches is Cross Point Baptist Church partnering for the health of those other churches and the spread of the gospel? With which churches are we partnering so that those churches will be healthier and that the gospel will spread through them? Got your answer? What are the names of those churches? Could you write them a letter? What would be the address? Could you, like the church in Babylon, send your greetings? To what church? Now, we might have names. Some of you might have names. Praise the Lord. But if we don't have names, if we don't have other churches with whom we have an actual pre-existing meaningful relationship, what do we do about that? Think for a minute. Brainstorm. Think of ideas. I'm not here to heap condemnation on you. I want us to obey together and fulfill the spirit of the passage. What can we actually do? How can we obey God? Which churches, near or far, need encouragement and sustenance from our church so that they will remain faithful to Christ and go on serving as a witness of the gospel of Christ because of the encouragement that we gave them? That's what's going on in the passage. Think of some churches brainstorm their names. What does it look like, though, to build those relationships, those church-to-church partnerships? How can we do it? How can we obey the spirit of the passage? How can we do the same thing Peter and Sylvanus and she who is Babylon and Peter's son Mark, how can we do the same thing that they did? Well, here's some ideas. The first is just simple relationship building with the members of other churches. Get to know them. Pray for them. Ask them what their needs are. Ask them how their church is doing, both individually, how are you doing, and also as a church. How's the church going? What are the needs of the church? Ask those kind of good questions. Second, I want you to know that I'm trying to cultivate, on behalf of our congregation, relationships with other local churches, especially with other pastors in the area. I want to build relationships with their pastors and therefore also with their churches. So this week, for example, I went to a monthly pastors gathering out in Memphis where a group of pastors, I don't know how many there were, 20 or 30 of us, get together. The whole goal is to build relationships with each other, to encourage each other's faith in Christ, to put it in Peter's language, to help one another stand firm in the true grace of God. I rode there in the car with David Lawrence, who's one of the pastors of Lucy Baptist, whom I prayed for just a minute ago. It would have been more efficient if I would have rode by myself and made some phone calls and got some stuff done. But I rode with David, this good brother. Why? So we could build relationships, get to know each other, encourage one another, help each other to stand firm. That's a way. What else? can we do to build real, meaningful, long-term, lasting, spiritually impactful relationships with other churches? There are more structured ways of going about it. There's affiliations. There's also church planting networks. I don't know if you've heard of a church planting network. Maybe it sounds newfangled. I don't know. Maybe it's foreign. But consider the ethos of our sermon text today and the interchurch relationships that are so easily visible there Peter going out of his way to try and encourage all these churches, sending their greetings, all this, we care about you, we want you to persevere in the faith. What's a church planting network? It's just a way of local churches and their pastors trying to link arms to help each other and encourage each other to fulfill the Great Commission in two ways. By helping each other be healthy and happy in Christ, right? Health of the mother churches, you might call them. And then also by actually helping one another to plant and pastor new churches. Health of the newborn churches. That's a thing that we could do. 
We could multiply examples, not insisting on a pati- any particular example. But what I have prayed is happening right now in all your hearts is that God is broadening our horizons outside of these four walls. Like Peter, like Sylvanus. God's purpose for our church is not exclusively in here. It is in here, but not exclusively in here. It's also out there. Both for the spread of the gospel through evangelism and missions, i.e. Great Commission, and also, especially like in our passage this morning, for the health and growth of other Churches, even down to lines in our budget. There is no kingdom of cross point. There is only the kingdom of Christ. Let's live that out together. Let's figure out how to do it together and be a blessing to other churches. Second part. How those kind of partnerships... Enable us to stand firm in God's grace. I think the main point of today's sermon text is found there in the second half of verse 12. I'm going to read it. You should look at it. Verse 12, Peter says this. I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. The word of God. Now, if you just look at your Bibles in your laps, you got to look, you'll see that Peter describes his writing, I have written to you, in two ways. I have written to you, how? Exhorting, and testifying. Peter understands this letter to be full of exhortation and the giving of testimony or attestation or declaration, telling them things. Those two parts. The first one, to exhort, means to urge strongly or to appeal earnestly to somebody. Just like the coach or the therapist or the king exhorts people, urges them to action. And this letter is full. I went back and looked. It is full of exhortation. I can't give you nearly all of Peter's exhortations, but let me just give you a little sample and summary to stir your hearts. Chapter one, he exhorted them to fix their hope completely on the grace to be brought to them at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Put all your hope on that day. Chapters two and three, he exhorted these Christians to submit to the authority of every human institution, whether government or slave master or husband. He exhorted them. Chapter 4, he exhorted them to go ahead and settle things in advance. If Jesus suffered undeservedly all the way to the cross for sins that were not his own, and it was the grossest injustice ever committed, if he did that, go ahead and settle it in advance that you are willing to suffer in the same way for following Jesus. And finally, in chapter 5, he exhorted the elders to shepherd the flock, the younger folks to submit to the elders, and all of them to humble themselves under the mighty hand of God and resist the devil. And that's only the smallest sampling of Peter's exhortations. He really was exhorting them the whole time through. His letter is saturated with exhortations in just about every paragraph. So think about it. Peter has written to them, exhorting them. And he wants them to stand firm in the faith. Let's do a thought experiment. Would the Christians who received this letter, would they have remained faithful to Christ? Would the elders have shepherded the flock honorably? Would the wives and slaves have submitted to the authorities over them if Peter had not exhorted them to do so? The answer is, we don't know for sure. God knows. I don't mean to press too far into the realm of the hypothetical, but there is a point, isn't there? It's crystal clear 
that Peter thinks his exhortations need to be given. You could say it differently. You could say that he expects God to use his exhortations to cause them to stand firm, or he wouldn't have written the letter. He sees the sheep about to be devoured by the roaring and prowling lion, and he knows they need exhortation and urging, and so he does it. In the same way that runners run better when they're encouraged, in the same way that soldiers on the front lines straighten their backbones when they're exhorted, listen to me, do you know this about yourself? Christians remain faithful to Jesus when other Christians exhort them to do so. There are some major implications to that truth. Here's one. Whom are you exhorting? To remain faithful to Christ. What's the name of that person? The person whom you most recently had a good heart to heart. How are you really doing? How's your soul? How can I pray for you? What's going on in your life? Do you remember that God loves you? You remember he's for you? Remember he'll keep all his promises? He will. He will. Because Peter was all in for helping other Christians just like this. That's why he wrote the letter. So was Sylvanus, so was the church in Babylon, so was Mark. Whom are you exhorting? Let's live that. When you talk to me, come and exhort me. Say, stand firm, follow Christ. Don't give in to temptations. But that's only looking at it one way. You can flip it around, right? It works the other way. Is it your habit to let other people talk to you the way that Peter talks to these Christians? Are you exhortable? Do you open yourself up? Can you be honest? Are you approachable? Are you knowable? Do you ever tell other people the scary stuff in your head that's scary to say out loud? The things that might raise eyebrows? Or do you have walls up? Is conversation always at the surface level on purpose? Are you afraid of letting people in? Have you been burned in the past and so now you don't let people in because you don't want to get burned again? If so, I believe this passage wars against that tendency. Do you see how you need other people? to get into your life and exhort you so that you won't back away from the battle in cowardice? You need to be exhorted. You're not better or different, neither am I, than all the people who got Peter's letter. They needed the letter. They needed to be exhorted. They needed other people. So do we. Peter assumes that they need it, and we need it too. That's exhorting. But I said Peter describes his writing in two ways. Not only exhorting, but also now testifying, which you could translate attesting or declaring. He's not only telling them what to do, exhortation, he's also telling them what's, pardon the rhyme, what's true, testifying, because believing the truth is essential for obedience. Let me say that again. Believing the truth is essential for obedience. And I can prove it to you. Let me illustrate. Think of your most nagging and besetting sin. Whatever sin that seems to always be nipping at your heels, always lurking in your shadow. Now imagine that you come to me as your pastor and you lay your heart bare, asking for help in battling this sin. And I look you in the eye and I tell you to just knock it off. Quit doing it. There's even an old Saturday Night Live skit that I don't know how I remember. And the same thing happens. She pours her heart out to this therapist or something, and he just says, stop it. It's laughable, right? Why do you laugh? If all that I had to offer you was bare exhortation, quit it. Do better. You think that's laughable. I do too. Because we all know that exhortation only is insufficient. 
You've already tried to knock it off, and you have failed. Have you noticed, as you read through 1 Peter, that not only is his letter full of exhortations, it's equally full of truth or doctrine. He's constantly testifying to the truth, weaving in doctrine together with all of his exhortations. He does it a little different than Paul. On Wednesday nights, we've been going through Ephesians, we're almost finished, and Paul, it's not quite as clean as this, but it really is kind of like this. The first three chapters of Ephesians are doctrine, testifying to what the truth is. And then the last three chapters, chapters four through six, are application. Now you should do this if this is true. But Peter does it a little differently than that. He weaves in his doctrine all together with his exhortations. I'll just give you one example, and then maybe you can see it all over 1 Peter for yourself. Back in verse chapter 2, rather, chapter 2, verse 18, Peter addresses the slaves, like I mentioned earlier, tells them to submit to their masters, even the crooked ones. That's the exhortation, submit. That's the exhortation. But then he builds his exhortation to submit on the foundation of truth or doctrine. Paul does the same thing, but he just sections the letter into halves. Peter weaves it in there all the time. So he exhorts the slaves to submit exhortation when they suffer. And then he lays that exhortation, submit, on the foundational truth that Jesus suffered unjustly also. That's not exhortation. That's truth. That's doctrine testifying to what the true grace of God is. So if you've got your Bibles and you're looking at it, chapter 2, verse 18, let me read it. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also those who are unreasonable. That's the command. Do this. And then you go down in verse 21, when he's finished giving the details of his command. In verse 21, he gives you the doctrine. Here's your foundation. What truth does a slave need to know if he's going to submit to an ungodly master? He needs to know some truth. Here it is, verse 21. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his steps, who, that's Jesus, committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. First, the exhortation, submit. Second, the testifying part. Jesus submitted to all the way to the cross for your salvation. Now back to 5.12, chapter 5, verse 12. Peter says that what he's written to them, both in exhortations and in the truth that grounds those exhortations, testifying, what he's written is the true grace of God and they must stand firm in it. This is the reason he wrote. He wants them to stand firm in the true grace of God that's in his letter. It's like Peter saying that his gospel is the gospel, and that even the really, really hard commands, they feel so difficult to us, about enduring unjust suffering, even all that, is the true grace of God. Can it really be the will of God for my life that I suffer when I don't deserve it? Peter says, this is the true grace of God. Embrace it. Stand firm in it. Don't shy away from it. That way of living is the trail that Jesus himself has blazed for you to walk. Chapter 2 said, follow in his footsteps. Put your feet where he put his feet until you get to be with him forever. Peter's command is, stand firm 
in the true grace of God. Let me conclude by trying to connect some dots and you can see how it all fits together. Peter tells these Christians who got his letter to stand firm and that his purpose in writing is that he wanted to help them do it. Their job is to stand firm. His job is is to get involved and help them stand firm. Do you want to stand firm in the true grace of God? I know that you do. You should assume that God will use other Christians to help you do that. It's his way. Immerse yourself in relationships with other Christians. Make yourself available, helpable, teachable, maybe even correctable. Prioritize those relationships. Go deep with some other people. Let them really know the real you and expect that God will use those people to help you to stand firm. And do it the other way around also. Leverage your time, your resources, like Sylvanus trekked all the way across that place by foot. Leverage your time and your resources for the benefit of other Christians and churches, expecting that God will use your efforts for their eternal joy, or to put it in the language of today's passage, so that they will stand firm and see Jesus on the last day and not be condemned. Use your time, use your money, use all the resources that you have. Let me say it to you another way. Let's make it our prayer that in five years, Cross Point will have a reputation in this community as a church that labors for the good of other local churches. But the context of this passage isn't most specifically about encouraging churches down the road, though I think that's a very legitimate application. The context is really about encouraging, excuse me, encouraging churches that are far away. So let's also make it our prayer that God will use us to strengthen other churches in faraway places, like especially churches that are conscientiously trying to spread the gospel of the risen Christ where he's not named. Can you think of any examples? Praise the Lord. How about the ones in Austria, the ones in Southeast Asia, and there are more? Do you know that interchurch partnerships, relationships, maybe is a better word, are a really good mission strategy? One church doing what Peter and Sylvanus did to help support and strengthen another church so they can go on being a healthy church and then also go on spreading the gospel of the crucified and risen Savior to the very dark places where they live. That's a great mission strategy. We should adopt it. Praise the Lord. I think the thing that will motivate us most, most, to pursue other individual Christians, but even other churches, maybe in our backyard and maybe far, far away across the ocean, what will motivate us to actually do it? I think the answer is that we need to see other churches and other Christians in the same way that Peter saw them. Do you remember how he opened his letter? Is it worth all the trouble and all the effort And all the expense? We're going to be talking about our budget tonight at our family meeting. It's okay. I think it was a service dog. Yeah, it's all right. We're going to be talking about our budget tonight. Is it worth all the work and headache and everything else? I think it's worth it when you think about other churches in the way that Peter did, and maybe you could say in the way that Jesus did. This is how I'm going to close. 
This is how Peter thought of the people who got this letter. You ready? I'm going to pray after I read it. To those who reside as aliens, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a wonderful and terrifying phrase, sprinkled with the blood of Christ. Thank you that you view all your people in just that way. The people for whom Christ died, for whom his blood was shed, the people whom he now risen from the dead, intercedes for and loves. So Lord, help us to love each other that way. Help us also to love other churches that way, both the ones in our backyard and the ones across the pond. Lord, help us, use us, make us not feel an obligation to do something, but to be irresistibly compelled to love your people the way that you do. And so use our resources, time, efforts, energies for their edification, strengthening, so that they'll stand firm. We pray that you would use us to cause some more of your people to stand firm in the true grace that comes from you because of the way that you used us. Use us as instrumental, essential. Put that in us and use us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.